Okay, let's finish this. Similarly, number of particles, let me write average values. N and U for number of particles and energy. So, if I do that, number of particles related to Q potential as keeping V and T constant, or in other words, we can also use if your independent variables are mu, V, and T, then you can take derivative with respect to mu to get the number of particles. Mu is the quantity related to the exchange of particles, number of particles. And the energy is coming out to be minus then beta q z v t and derivative is to keep z and v constant or that is equal to k v t squared derivative with respect to temperature of Q Z V T keeping Z and V constant. Helmholtz free energy, if you want to calculate Helmholtz free energy using Q potential, here is the way you do it, You can relate Helmholtz free energy to logarithm of the ground canonical partition function in this manner. Or you can simply write minus KBT ln of Q ground canonical VT divided by z to the power n. This is Helmholtz free energy. Finally, entropy comes out to be u minus a over t by definition of the Helmholtz free energy, u minus ts. You get kvt dq dt zv minus n ln z plus k times q. That means if you know q potential, well in turn that means if you know the ground canonical partition function, you know the whole thermodynamics how to get the thermodynamics from grand canonical partition function. Now, since you are going to read more than one book, 
other than yours, Patria, there are other books. They use a different potential. They call it grand potential. Yeah, you should be aware of this. There's a small difference between our Q potential and the omega potential, grand potential. You can easily make the connection. Ground potential is defined as omega, and that is defined as KBT ln Q, lambda of free energy, if you like. You can read about this in other books. You can't come across with this. The only difference is this factor, isn't it? We call it logarithm Q. Q potential, you may redefine it as minus KBT and then Q, grand canonical partition function, as grand potential omega. So you write everything in terms of this omega. Very similar pro procedure. Omega as u minus Ts or g minus Pv minus mu n bar. You can read about this, comes out to be minus Pv. So Q, our Q potential is ln of Q, ln of grand canonical partition function or minus omega over kbt. So that is the relation between q and omega potentials, q potential and grand potential omega. And of course this comes out to be pv over kbt. So that omega comes out to be minus p times v. Our q was pv over kvt. So there's a sign change and a factor of KBT is taken out in our case. That's the relationship between Q potential and omega grand potential. You might have studied omega. It doesn't make much difference. Now I will say a few words about fugacity, its physical meaning. I have just defined it as e to the beta mu. What, what does it mean physically? You can search about it, learn about it. But fugacity, this z, quantity z defined in this chapter. Has a physical meaning. Beta is 1 over kBT. Mu is the chemical potential. This simple thing is related, relates to tendency of a substance, substance or a system to prefer one phase
that could be gas, liquid, or solid, to prefer one phase over another. Or tendency to flee or escape from one state to another, from one particular state to another. With that I mean the phase. The most favorable phase is the one with lowest fugacity. Okay? Phase with lowest fugacity will be the most favorable. <coughs> so, it will have the lowest tendency to escape from the state. That means that state will be having the lowest, that is minimum, gives free energy. Okay? But fugacity is not a physical property of a substance. It is a calculated quantity. Okay? Does it have any unit? Well, exponentials, trigonometric functions, they cannot have units, of course. So it is a calculated quantity, but in physical sense, it corresponds to its tendency to escape from one phase to another. Now you see why grand canonical ensemble is the correct one to study the energy and particle exchange. That's what's going to happen when a substance goes from one phase to another. Now let's remember the systems containing distinguishable particles and indistinguishable particles because we know what Q will be for those systems. So n particle partition function will be related to a single particle partition function if the particles are not interacting. If the systems are ideal systems, that's what we are doing up to now. And we are going to do for a couple of chapters from now on. So let's see how we are going to write simply the grand canonical partition function in those cases. That means, well, here is my grand canonical partition function. Sometimes you can also see in some books as curly z. Okay. very simply written as sum over particle number fugacity to the power n canonical partition function if particles are non-interacting
i.e. if the system is ideal, ideal classical gas, ideal quantum gas, gases, if this is the case, now you know that this QNVT can be written as 1 over n factorial single particle partition function to the power n if they are indistinguishable. If you cannot identify one particle from distinguish from one particle from the other, if they are indistinguishable, like atoms or molecules making up a gas, then you can relate the n particle canonical partition function to one particle canonical partition function. If they are distinguishable, you don't have this n factorial, you simply raise to the power n if distinguishable. As in the case of phonons, that means harmonic oscillators oscillating at lattice points, so spatially you know where they are, so they are distinguishable. In that case, you don't have that factor. Remember that? So this also simplifies our calculation of grand canonical ensemble partition function. Let's write that. We can do that sum easily using that property. For the indistinguishable particles, calculation is very simple. Grand canonical partition function becomes simply isn't it? Z to the n, Q1 to the n divided by n factorial if you put that for Qn. What is this? Do you know? The sum? Something to the power n divided by n factorial, sum over all n. Exponential, isn't it? This is nothing but Now, if this is a system of distinguishable particles, the grand canonical partition function can be written as simply a sum over n, single particle partition function times the fugacity to the power n. It's a power series. What is the result of this? 1 over 1 minus x, x to the n. In this case, Z times Q1 must be smaller than 1 for convergence.
So, things are a little bit simplified in these cases, isn't it? I'm finished with the program. When you think about grand canonical ensemble, you should know all these. Define a Q potential and use that Q potential to get the whole thermodynamics. Q potential in terms of grand canonical partition function, logarithm of it. Very simple. You should know these to be able to do any calculation in this ensemble. Okay? I have done the similar thing for canonical ensemble. In terms of partition function, I, I gave you the whole thermodynamics. So, the quantity that you, you should concentrate on is to calculate the respective partition functions for both ensembles. In microcanonical ensemble, it was the calculation of the available volume of phase space when you divide it with the volume of fundamental volume corresponding to a single classical state, then you get the total number of available states and whose logarithm is related to entropy. That was the connection with the thermodynamics, you remember? Okay. But since the phase space is 6n dimensional space, you should know the volume of n dimensional space in that case. So I give you everything all mental map of what you should do in an exam in coming midterm one. You should have a mental map to follow to solve problems. Have you organized the problem sessions? What are you waiting for? We are in chapter four, people. You should have done chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, up to now. So what are you waiting for? Hmm? Why don't you come and tell me? I have his phone number. <laughs> okay, then. do you have any questions with these basic things? Anything? Is it clear enough? Okay. Now, the problem session. I will apply this to specific systems. So you should look at these exercises as specific problems you can use your knowledge to solve. And the first example is the classical ideal gas. I'm always doing that in any ensemble I'm talking about. So let's do the classical ideal gas in grand canonical ensemble. Have you done this before? Of course. But let's redo it. Examples. We have the program, everything is ready. We know how to approach the problem. Since the particles are going are not interacting yet, so we can apply all, everything that we have written up to now.
Now for this, we have calculated the single particle partition function. We don't have to do it again. It was simply v over h cube 2 pi mkbt 3 m's. For the classical gas in a box of volume V, at temperature T, that was the single particle partition, canonical partition function. Was that done in the class? Yes, I did that. Check your notes. We can write this as V over lambda T cube. Lambda T I define as thermal wavelength, isn't it? H divided by the square root of that. Since we have H cube and cube of that quantity, which is lambda T cube, one over lambda T cube, because H divided by 2 pi m k b t is lambda t, so it is v over lambda t cube. All temperature dependence is in lambda t as t to the power 3 halves. So why don't we call this v times the quantity, which is a function of temperature only? Okay. Since we may be taking derivative with respect to temperature and volume, we explicitly write the dependencies like this. So f of t is nothing but 1 over lambda t cube. Okay. Now let's calculate the grand canonical partition function. From there we can calculate the Q potential. ZVT. Well, the definition is don't worry about the form. If you keep writing it, it will be very easy for you to write the same in the exam. You have to get used to writing things. That's what homeworks are doing for you. Z to the n, an n particle canonical partition function. In this case, it is Z V F of T to the power N. Well, we can consider the uh, particles to be indistinguishable, a gas of classical particles. You might be given particles to be distinguishable, then you don't have this n factorial, isn't it? So if given distinct indistinguishable, that's what you should do. Of course, that is nothing but an exponential, z times q1 or into the z times v times f of t. See, very simple calculation of grand canonical partition function in this case. That gives you very simply the Q potential too. Q is ln z 
that's Vt. That means z times v times f of t, isn't it? Exponential, exponent comes down. Then you take logarithm. And since we know what the Q potential is, we can easily calculate the thermodynamic quantities, kBT over V times Q. That's what we found in the earlier lecture. This kBT over V, Z, V, F of T. V will cancel. So it is pressure comes out to be Z, V, F of T. Okay? Is that okay? <laughs> Very simple. I'm not doing any tricks or anything. Just using my results. Number of particles, let's calculate that. These are average values. Z del Q does Z. Keeping V and T constant. It is Z times V times F of T. Huh? Yes. Z K V T F of T. Sorry. <laughs> simple. <laughs> and mistakes are also very simple. Z K B T F of T, of course. N is Z V F of T. Is that okay? Now let's complete this. Can calculate. So what do we have? P over KBT is found to be Z F of T. Rewriting this, N over V is found to be the same thing. Isn't it? N over V is Z times F of T. P over KBT is Z times F of T. So they must be equal. So these two things equal means P times V must be equal to NKBT. It is not a surprise, isn't it? We are doing classical gas problem. So we have to have equation of state for a classical gas. And we find it. It is not depending on what ensemble you are using. So that's our first result. But we can also calculate, exactly as we did for the canonical case, the thermodynamic quantities. Here is internal energy, for example, using the same quantities. Here is well, you can write pressure as N lambda T cube over V, introducing the form with lambda T. 
Oh, this is not correct. I'm jumping a little bit. It is ZKBT over lambda T cube. So what I have written is for Z and lambda T cube over V. OK. See, this second lecture is shorter because I've taken 10 or 15 minutes of time for the first lecture. We're almost at the end. So this gives you a, an internal energy, an energy as KBT squared was found to be del Q del T, keeping Z and V constant. This is the reason why I took the T dependence explicitly. I am going to take derivative with respect to T. If you take the derivative, I don't have to do it. It comes to be KB T squared N 3 over 2 T. <coughs> so U turns out to be using the expression and KVT as you expect for the energy. So instead of me doing all the algebra, why don't you do the other calculations? For example, A, the Helmholtz free energy is minus KBT ln Q ZVT divided by Z to the power N. This comes out to be N KBT ln Z minus Z times V KBT F of T. Do this yourself. And finally, entropy, which is KBT dq dt zv minus nkbrz that comes out to be minus nkb lnz plus z vkb T D over D T lambda T cube minus we can stop here.